China wants Taiwan badly, and it seems to be super confident about being able to pull off a successful invasion. But there are a few things it hasn't taken into consideration in its master plan. You see, China and Taiwan have been at each other's throats for decades, with tensions soaring to new heights in recent years and the world seemingly on the brink of World War III, it's impossible not to wonder what would happen in the event of a full-scale Chinese invasion of Taiwan. On the surface, China is the favorite to win this fight, with their military and economy being superior in almost every area. But no one will know for sure until the bullets start flying. As Mike Tyson once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Now that begs the question, could China actually conquer Taiwan through military intervention? To properly tell this story, we have to go back to the beginning. Taiwan came under Japanese control beginning in 1895 and lasting until World War II ended in 1945. During this time, the Taiwanese people suffered unimaginable hardships, discrimination, and even enslavement in some cases. When Japan surrendered all of its ill-gotten territorial possessions in late 1945, Taiwan's future was uncertain. China was embroiled in a devastating civil war that was shaking its society down to its foundation. On one side, you had the Chinese Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong, and on the other side was Chiang Kai-shek, a former US ally against the Japanese and leader of the Nationalist Party. In the late 1940s, being friends with communists wasn't exactly popular, so the United States bet on Chiang Kai-shek. The war did not go well for them, and the nationalists eventually pulled all of their forces back to Taiwan. They established the island as their final stand and turned it into a fortress that has stood the test of time. Now this is where the root of the problem lies. The war never officially ended, with both sides claiming ownership of the island and no one willing to compromise. The communists claimed that Taiwan was traditionally a Chinese province and should be brought back into the fold with the rest of the country. Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists claimed that Taiwan may have been historically Chinese but was not part of a modern China, which was founded during the 1911 revolution that overthrew the Qing dynasty and thus should be independent. So here they sit, once brothers, now bitter enemies, staring at each other across 80 miles of water. With Taiwan democratizing itself throughout the 80s and 90s, it's been in the middle of incredible changes to the global economic and political landscape. Its relationship with the United States has only deepened and its role on the world stage expanded. Hailed as a bastion of democracy, Taiwan has found itself at the center of an ideological heavyweight boxing match between East and West. Their economic importance also cannot be overstated. Much of the world's electronics, including phones, computers, and gaming consoles, require computer chips, the vast majority of which are produced in Taiwan. Whatever way you are watching this right now, there's a good chance parts of it come from Taiwan. Taiwanese manufacturing accounts for about 65% of the world market, with one Taiwanese company, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, or TSMC, producing over half of the world's chips by itself. Since 1949, the battle lines have been drawn. Tensions have risen, lowered, and risen again, but we have never been closer to an all-out war between China and Taiwan than we are now. Here are five reasons why a Chinese invasion of Taiwan would fail. Reason number one. Geography. Remember geography in school? For some kids, it's probably the most boring thing they've ever had to sit through in their lives. But I would venture a guess that if you're watching this channel, you weren't one of those kids. It's also one of the main factors that could swing the pendulum in Taiwan's favor. Taiwan is situated southeast of mainland China, separated by the Taiwan Strait, at the intersection of the East China Sea and the South China Sea. With a climate ranging from tropical to subtropical, the weather can be unpredictable at times. Parts of the island can even have different weather patterns a few miles apart from each other. Typhoons, dense fog, high winds, two monsoon seasons, tropical storms, and possible 20-foot waves make any invasion risky. Now, why is the weather such an advantage here? That's because, as it currently stands, China would most likely attempt an amphibious invasion as the primary method of attack, with an airborne assault coming soon after, and of course a blanket of withering cover fire provided by their navy and air force. That's all well and good, but if the rain is unrelenting, the Navy can't get a straight shot because of the rolling ocean, and the Air Force can't even take off because of a wall of fog, then the invasion probably isn't going to go so well. There is only a small window of time during the summer months when conditions for an invasion would even be feasible. The geographical advantages don't end there. 
Around Taiwan are over 100 small islands, and these islands have been equipped with a variety of defense systems, including surface-to-air and anti-ship missiles. Getting the Chinese Navy across the strait and into position will be tough enough, but the whole way they will face a gauntlet of fire. Even choosing which beach to land on has its difficulties, as there are only about a dozen suitable beaches on which the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, could land, and even then they are rugged. At low tide, Chinese tanks would be particularly exposed to anti-armor and artillery fire due to the long stretches of muddy, barren coastline. Where does that fire come from? That would be the multiple steep and rugged mountain ranges that cover Taiwan. Historically, mountain ranges have been a defender's best friend. From antiquity to the present, using mountains has been the key to victory for many an outnumbered army. Taiwan's strategy is no different, as they use their topography to their advantage and have turned the island into a fortress. The mountains are home to a network of caves and tunnels used for everything from defensive strongpoints to logistical support. It's from these caves and tunnels that the Taiwanese defenders will rain down death and destruction on the Chinese as they attempt to establish a beachhead. The task of the PLA is made even more difficult by the fact they would have to go into the urban and mountainous areas simultaneously with airborne troops if they wanted a chance of victory. Always thinking one step ahead, Taiwan has one last trick up its sleeve that makes its geography such a valuable asset. They make their geography work for them using something called A2AD, Anti-Access Area Denial. A2AD basically means that through precision weapon systems such as drones, missiles, artillery, etc., the attackers are guided into the areas where the defenders want them to go and where the greatest amount of damage can be inflicted. For instance, if Taiwan wanted the PLA to land on specific beaches on the western side of the island, they could concentrate their anti-ship missiles and drone strikes on anything that was trying to cross over to the eastern side, thus making the western approach the only viable option. A2AD is a part of China's strategy as well, and it's fair to say that whoever is able to control where and when the actual fighting takes place could very well control the outcome of the battle. Weather, topography, and controlling the battlefield are crucial elements to Taiwan's success, but the next reason is what happens when the rubber meets the road. Reason number two, defense in depth. Any good military commander will tell you that to truly be effective, you have to know your history. The Taiwanese have really taken this lesson to heart as they have adopted a strategy similar to one the Japanese employed during the Pacific theater of World War II. To even the casual military history fan, the name Iwo Jima conjures up images of guerrilla-style warfare and the Japanese defenders using every inch of the island above and below ground to turn it into a slaughterhouse. While the Marine Corps and naval forces of the United States eventually did triumph at Iwo, it came at great cost. Taiwan finds itself in a similar situation to that of the Iwo Jima defenders. They face an amphibious invasion by an overwhelming foe, and their only options are to hold out until reinforcements arrive, inflict such horrific casualties that the invader retreats, or death. As previously stated, the Taiwanese have a big advantage when it comes to defensive warfare, that being their topography. Rugged mountains cross the island and are a natural fortress against invasion. But what makes them so valuable is how they are being used. The Chinese will try to soften up Taiwanese positions with a preliminary bombardment from the Navy or from missiles, but the Taiwanese are ready. Much like the defenders on Iwo, the Taiwanese have constructed an unknown number of caves, bunkers, support stations, and tunnels through the mountains and over the island itself. These defensive and support installations allow the defenders to inflict damage and create chaos while being relatively unseen. In addition to their potential destructive uses, the caves and tunnels are also crucial for maintaining supplies and fighting ability. This infrastructure they have created allows them to move men, weapons, and supplies from one point to another without being exposed to danger. A great example of this is the tunnel complex near Kirshan Air Force Base on Taiwan's eastern side. The complex near Kirshan is capable of housing, repairing, and arming over 200 aircraft. It also provides support facilities for the Taiwanese defenders, such as a hospital and supply warehouses. There are multiple complex like Kirshan around the island, and they are absolutely crucial to Taiwan maintaining control of its airspace and giving its military the best chance it has to win. While all this sounds great on paper, China does get a say in what happens as well. They won't just roll over. The Chinese strategy has been, and always will be, to overwhelm Taiwan with its larger military. 
China believes that to conquer Taiwan and subdue the population, they need a 3 to 1 advantage, which comes out to about 1.3 to 2.5 million Chinese soldiers. To give some context, China has about 2.1 million active troops, compared to Taiwan's active troops which number about 170,000. The Taiwanese choose to play what some NBA fans might call small ball. Small ball is where a smaller, less physically strong team chooses to rely on their speed, agility, and discipline to win games. Go ahead and ask the Golden State Warriors how that strategy has been working out so far. Taiwan's version of Steph Curry, aka someone who runs circles around you and then hits three-pointers until you no longer have the will to continue, is Mobile Asymmetrical Weapon Systems. Mobile Asymmetrical Weapon Systems are things like the Javelin or Stinger missiles, weapons that are portable but also devastating to the enemy, maximizing your advantages like stealth and speed while minimizing the enemy's armor and numerical advantage. This tactic has proven devastatingly effective in Ukraine, as Ukrainian forces strike from wherever they need to and level the playing field by taking out vast numbers of Russian armor. Similar results could be achieved in the wake of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. This is where defensive fortifications and infrastructure come into play. The goals of guerrilla warfare are to unexpectedly and decisively strike the enemy and then melt away unharmed, preparing to strike again. With their spread out, hidden, well-fortified and well-provisioned defensive works, the Taiwanese military can, theoretically, do to the PLA what smaller armies have done to larger ones for centuries – slowly bleed them dry. Combine that with an esprit de corps that usually brings a nation together when an invading army arrives on the doorstep, the Chinese are in trouble. Especially when you consider that the Chinese military hasn't fought anyone since 1979, they might be a little rusty. There is one part of their plan, though, that they have absolutely no experience with in times of war – the internet. How it's used and how available it is to both sides could have a critical role in the outcome of a potential invasion. Reason number three – Satellite Communications Taiwanese internet connection internally and externally is primarily reliant on a series of undersea cables. Is this so hilariously vulnerable that it has to be a decoy of some kind? Hard to say, but one thing is certain – from the moment the invasion begins, China will unleash a devastating cyber attack on Taiwan and sever those cables. If internet connection is lost or is hit by cyber attacks, it will have crippling effects on the civilians and military. From multi-million dollar weapon systems to the infantry sitting in the trenches, internet connection is taking on a larger role in warfare than ever before and can be the difference between life and death for many soldiers. Starlink and other companies like it are a beacon of hope for the Taiwanese defenders. Utilizing satellite internet connection, troops on the ground can feel confident in their internal communications, as well as their ability to coordinate drone and artillery strikes. Externally, the connection would be used to communicate with the outside world and keep Taiwanese allies up to date on the evolving situation, something that might prove decisive as the battle goes on. Trying to stop the flow of disinformation and show the world the true situation on the ground has been critical for the Ukrainian armed forces and President Zelensky. Why is that important? According to the Greek dramatist Aeschylus, in war, truth is the first casualty. On the civilian side of things, the Taiwanese government has to stay in control of what information their population receives. If the Chinese are allowed to control the narrative and influence the Taiwanese people using propaganda, it might destroy their will to fight before the battle even begins. Keeping Taiwan in the dark and limiting its technological capabilities is a cornerstone of the Chinese strategy. Companies like Starlink are making this much more difficult. Reason number 4. International Support it's no secret that the United States and other major world powers are staunch supporters of Taiwanese independence and autonomy. The United States is the main weapons provider for Taiwan and has defensive agreements that could bring US firepower to the South China Sea in the event of an invasion. President Xi and the Chinese government are well aware of this arrangement, and it's one of the main deterrents that keep their forces on Chinese soil. If a major military collision were to kick off, the full might of the United States military would, theoretically, be riding to Taiwan's aid. It is theoretical because the wording of the agreement, the Taiwan Relations Act, is rather vague and implies the US would intervene militarily but does not directly say it. The threat of US intervention has done the trick so far and has convinced the Chinese to stay put. As it currently stands, the US has bases all over the Pacific, but the most important ones in this situation are those located within Japan and the Philippines. 
US forces have been stationed in Japan since World War II ended and have turned the country into a vital component of the US defense plan in the Pacific. With over 20 bases in the country, US forces can supply, support, and launch major military operations with terrifying speed. The US presence in the Philippines is equally as important to deterring China and has been growing larger in recent years. The US signed the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement EDCA, with the Philippine government back in 2014. This allowed them to build nine military bases, rotate troops through the country, and train local forces. With both of these major areas of operation so close to Taiwan, it's reasonably fair to say that any incursion by the Chinese would be met with good old American lead. If that were to happen, all Taiwan would have to do is hold out until they could be reinforced, which could turn China's situation from a localized operation to a full-scale international catastrophe. A catastrophe that would spill over into every facet of their society, including the economy. Reason number five, economic disaster. One of the main reasons why Taiwan is so crucially important to the rest of the world is its ability to manufacture semiconductors or computer chips. They are the world leaders in quantity and quality, producing 65% of the world's semiconductors. If production were to suddenly stop in the event of something like an invasion, the world economy would be upended. A stunning amount of what the world uses in its businesses and personal lives requires semiconductors. Everything from computers to smartphones, refrigerators and cars, to military technology, and even producing clean energy. The semiconductor shortage the world saw from 2020 to 21 was a minuscule preview of what could happen if that crucial supply was cut off. China would certainly be affected by this, as their cross-channel trade with Taiwan is estimated to be worth around $50 billion, and the steady flow of semiconductors is the lifeblood of the manufacturing sector of their economy. The effects on the Chinese economy and its people would be nothing short of disastrous. China, the US, and the rest of the world are working on producing their own semiconductors, but are still years away from producing the same quality that are produced in Taiwan. In the event of a Chinese invasion, the PLA would attempt to seize the factories and manufacturing plants where the semiconductors are produced. All they would find, however, would be ashes, or at the very least, inoperable machinery, as the Taiwanese and the rest of the world would rather tank the economy and halt production than give the Chinese a global monopoly on such a precious resource. A blow of this magnitude to the Chinese semiconductor and electronics manufacturing industry would have ramifications that would be felt for years to come and would certainly affect their ability to fight a war. Another important economic deterrent would be the sanctions that would be imposed on China if they decide to invade. As seen with Russia since its invasion of Ukraine, the international community has hit Russia with crippling sanctions and decimated its economy. China's reliance on imports and exports could be the soft underbelly that would deter or cause an invasion to fail. About 20% of the Chinese economy is exports and has seen that percentage gradually increase since COVID. Being unable to export their manufactured goods due to sanctions would create an unprecedented economic disaster for Xi's government. In addition to this, China is becoming increasingly reliant on food imports due to their low cost and diminishing amount of Chinese farmland caused by over-fertilization and environmental degradation. China's rising level of food insecurity means that they are vulnerable to food crises and civil disturbances. If the invasion does happen, China would be hit with multiple sanctions that would greatly limit its ability to import anything, including food. The last food crisis in China, known as the Great Famine, lasted from 1959 to 61 and is the largest famine in human history, with over 30 million dead as a result. At present, these economic factors seem to be enough to deter invasion, but if an invasion was to happen, they would surely be one of the main causes of failure for the Chinese. You can't fight a war without money or food. Looking at all the information we have available, we still can't predict what will happen with 100% certainty. But I think it's safe to say that Taiwan is not the pushover that China would have you believe it is. Taiwan can win, or at the very least delay, until the cavalry arrives, but it would need a lot of factors to go its way. The real question is whether or not China has the stomach for a prolonged and bloody conflict, the likes of which few Chinese citizens have ever seen. It ain't the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Let us know what you think, and what you think the implications of such an invasion would be down in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe as well for more military analysis from military experts.